our shadows. <laughs> Okay, we can start. So we're gonna open the meeting. First thing is to approve the agenda. I'd like to add or modify a couple items. One is I would like to talk a little bit about ground rules of behavior right after the agenda is approved. And I'd like on number seven update from Paco and Telebit. I'd like to add that um, I'm gonna present the invoice you got emailed. It's attached to the agenda that Brent sent out. It's for the presentations that would be added to number seven. And on number eight, we're gonna discuss the schedule of the annual meeting, but also a bit about the three-year budget and the town meeting ballot item with that subject matter. Anyone else have something to add? If there's no dissent, then I would say by unanimous consent, we'll accept the agenda with those modifications. Thank you. And when I talk about ground rules, it's just really important that within the meeting that we have procedures. And I like the one that the city council has adopted about best intentions, intentions that we assume the best intentions from each of us. But by the same token, we need to make sure that we're not attacking people when we disagree and that we can be called out of order when we do such, that it's really important to respect that we're all here trying to support the advancement of public safety for our region. And with that, I'd just like to say that I feel <laughs> Whitaker has been inappropriate to me, not only in sometimes these meetings, but on the streets in other public meetings where he's criticizing me personally and making accusations about things that I cannot deal with in the context that he's presenting them. So I just wanna go on record here that I'm asking Stephen not to do that, that if you have difficulty with whatever happens in my role with public safety authority, at least it stays in the context of this meeting and, and public safety authority meetings. And even within those meetings, I ask that you don't attack me and call me a liar, challenge my uh, ethics that I'm any making mistakes. Okay, we'll correct them. Uh, trying to address to be more transparent will do better. But attacking a person I, I, is not part of your right with the open meeting law or the public records. So I would ask you to try to contain and focus on the public records issues that you have and the open meeting law records of the activity that you have. Thank you. And now we have public comment. Uh, Steve Whitaker, uh, first I'm raising a point of order that the, uh, the effective participation required under open meeting law uh, has not yet accommodated uh, these hybrid meetings. And the way the city deals with it is by connecting a laptop to a screen and having amplified speakers. At the last meeting, uh, we were relying on Donna's laptop and speakers, which were facing her and denying the public the ability to see who's speaking and to hear properly what's going on in a meeting. So that is not compliant with the spirit and intent of open meeting law. Uh, so having a, you know, a nosebleed seat where you can't quite hear what's going on or you can't see who's talking unless everyone wants to identify themselves every time they speak uh, is inconsistent with the purpose of having a designated location for somebody to participate in a meeting. So I will differ and defend against the allegations that I am attacking. Uh, I am blunt about calling violations of open meeting and public records law. That's not an attack. That's a point of fact. That's a, uh, a, a characterization of compliance with the law. So to the exaggerations and the hyperbole that you just heard about how Donna feels are not consistent with what conversations we've had. But the, the problem here is that the, even the city is making preparations to 
if we're going to use a designated location, a machine connected to Zoom has to be hooked up to a screen that be, can be seen by, by everyone in the room and speakers so, such that everyone in the room can hear. And having a laptop, uh, uh, Brent's laptop is unavailable to be shared tonight because he's keeping the minutes and Donna needs to be able to uh, stare at hers. So um, I'm just raising, raising that one. Secondly, the agenda tonight does not include board discussion of the open meeting violation notice that was filed. That requires the board to take action, which hasn't happened. Uh, so I have worked, and, and as you know, this, this has been an issue with Capital Fire. It's been an issue with other, you know, I'm a stickler for making sure we're warning meetings properly, allowing for participation in the meetings, and getting minutes posted on time, et cetera. And I do not want to see, after years of investment by many of us, uh, this uh, organization fall into the same problems uh, of playing fast and loose with the law. And as an example, I heard at the last meeting, uh, the chair says, oh, let's go ahead and proceed and uh, we'll fix it by ratifying it at another meeting. In effect, it is admission of violation of open meeting law and, oh, we'll fix it by ratifying it at the next meeting. That doesn't fly. That will not fly in front of a judge. It shouldn't fly among any of you uh, to the ethical standards that the oath you've taken here. So uh, I ask your uh, adherence to strict open meeting law and public records law. Um, I have comments about the Televate report and the, which I was not able to make under the circumstances of last meetings, uh, limited laptop and no visual of who's speaking, um, as well as where we go from here with financing and engineering phase of uh, beyond the Televate report. So I ask your support in making sure I have an opportunity at the appropriate time in the discussion uh, and that I not get shut out by the chair. You're still here. <laughs> Welcome back. They won't recognize me without me. Oh, the space password? Yeah. We can still see you on here. Well, you is might be a... able to see me. Sorry, when <laughs> I moved I can't. it, it flopped. Uh, my understanding is as long as I give Steve access to talk into the computer and he can hear that we are not required to have equipment. We happen to be in a room of the cities that has equipment, but we do not have that expertise or permission to use their equipment. And if that is something that the board wants to proceed with, then we can see what that will be. But at some point, you know, the city is lending us this space and they may be willing without cost. I don't know. But what I have been advised is that the open meeting law at this point does not expect everyone to be able to do what the city of Montpelier has or the city of Barrie has as far as equipment. And so indeed, anytime Steve wants to talk in a point of order within the meeting, I'll give me his laptop to him to face and he can talk into it and he can hear. That's the most important he can hear. And I will verify, I um, in going to the uh, violations about the open meeting law, I did not read that as having to come back to the board. I will do that and proceed accordingly. The next aspect is improvement of minutes for July 10th, uh, June 10th, August 12th. Uh, Whoops. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm sorry, you got a thumb up there by the tree. Sorry, couldn't see yeah. it. I, I just want to know who else is in the room because I can't see a quorum in my gallery oh, view. Okay, yes. All right. Uh, I'll come back to attendance. Jim, you have something. You're waving. But you're, you're muted, Jim. Yeah, with regard to uh, Stephen's comments, uh, I have been quite familiar with open meeting law over the years. I, there may be in some recent changes because of COVID that I'm not aware of. But the law requires that the public be able to see how someone votes. That's all. 
So I recommend that we do a roll call on each vote that will uh, accommodate that. Uh, and I also want to say that I think Stevens made some valuable contributions at times, but it's outweighed by his disruption. And I would ask that you strictly enforce the public comment period, uh, limit it to the time that you award it, and then um, go on and not uh, allow uh, any more public comment outside of that time. Okay. Um, it would, I would appreciate it if everybody uh, would just, I will say, oh, Doug, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Doug. You're muted too. I don't want to belabor this any more than it's absolutely necessary, but I just re remind Stephen and everybody else that the Zoom link and the audio link is open to all, and this meeting is being recorded. I'm, I'm, do not see any open meeting violations. Okay, for attendance, what I see is I see uh, Jim, Doug, Kim and myself that we have a salad. We have five people here. And me. Oh, and Brent, we have six people mm -hmm. here. Are you on the screen? Where are you on the screen, Brent? So we have six board members here. Does that answer your question, Kim? Yes, it does, I guess. Okay, and I, I think uh, it's a good point. I think it's helpful for people to say their name and then speak. Because even when I can see, I don't always know who's speaking, looking at the screen. So just say your name and then make your comment. That'll help the secretary as well as Stephen. So I'm looking for approval of the minutes for June 10th, 12th, and September 9th. Uh, Doug, you're muted, but I see you talking. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell my lips are moving. Uh, I move approval. And Jim, was that a second on your mouth? I'll second. Okay, Jim, second. Uh, any other further comments about the minutes? Yes, I want to compliment Brent on a very thorough job. There's a real record here that is, hopefully some historian will find them interesting. So thank you, Brent. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye, wave your hand. Oh, no, we're going to do it out loud. We're going to do it out loud. So I'm just going to go across this my screen as you appear. So uh, Jim, um, you have to unmute yourselves, folks. Aye. Thank you. Doug? Aye. Brent? Aye. Kim? Aye. Sally? Aye. And myself? Aye. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Next is, you just passed the minutes for September 9th, but just to be absolutely sure that we're verifying, ratifying all the motions passed at the September 9th meeting that were included in those minutes. This is to correct any inverted error that was done with not having the right posting of the agenda on City Hall. I entertain a motion to ratify all the motions passed on September 9th. I'll so move. Thank you, Kim. Second. Second from Jim. Any further discussion? All in favor? Jim? I heard an eye, but you, you did the opposite. You muted when you should have. <laughs> <laughs> We still can't hear you, Jim. You're muted. Uh, I'm sorry, Jim. We still haven't heard a yes. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Doug? Yes. Brent? Aye. Kim? Aye. Sally? Aye. Donna? Aye. Okay. Review and approve payment for the annual membership of Vermont League of City and Towns. Uh, the membership for an, a full associate member is $950. It is due, it was actually due July 1, but they sent the bill to Kim and we've gotten that address around. 
but I also went from a restricted associate membership to a full membership, which allows me access to their legal uh, team there for advice that I've used for both the open meeting law and, web and record request. So that's an additional $320 annually, which is probably what, two hours with a lawyer, Kim? Uh, I have no idea, but I would guess it's something like that. Well, I figured it's quite worth it. I really found it worth it this year, and you can make a decision next year or not. But I would really appreciate the full mem membership and continued uh, connection with their legal team. I always think talking to lawyers is money well spent. <laughs> okay, so uh, entertain a motion to be made for paying them the $950. Before we wrote on that, can you tell me how much is in the treasury? Yes, we have, oh, well, it's complicated because um, if you take out the invoice we should be receiving from Televet yeah. and what we've allocated for PACO, we have probably about $42,000. Oh, okay. With everything that's allocated, not really spent because not all the invoices have come in. But the, but, okay. the world accounting, that's what that, we That would be the balance when everything's paid. And that's spending the full 55000 for around the study. And that includes another item that's going to be later talked about. Yes, it's about 52000 $53,000. And we'll get a report soon, I expect. But I just, yes. Wanted, yes. just wanted to know where we stand. Thank you. And it is complicated because we don't have an active treasurer. And it would be wonderful if we could modify that. But I will get a full report to you uh, in November because along with the annual meeting coming up, we have to also start looking at our three-year budget. As, as, but, but back uh, to this motion to keep us focused here. Um, uh, does that answer your question dealing with paying the 950? It does, but you raise another one. Has Bev declined to continue as treasurer? She's, uh, for this year, yes. But I don't think she wants to continue next year. Okay. Thank so uh, any other comments about the motion specific, the payment to Vermont League? Membership, $950. I support it. I'll move we approve it. So we'll take the vote. Jim? Yeah, second. Aye. Oh, well, I'll have a second. Sorry. I'll, I'll second. Oh, Brent's going to second, second the motion. Thank you for that reminder. Jim? Aye. Doug? Yes. Brent? Aye. Kim? Yes. Sally? Aye. Myself? Aye. Thank you. Uh, mostly the next item is to let, let you all know and to have a little discussion about Televit's uh, presentation on October 19th at 6 p.m. It's the joint council meeting that Barry City Council will host. And even though they're hosting it, both the Public Safety Authority and Capital Fire will be posting their own agendas, taking their own minutes. Um, and you can be there in person or you can do it remotely. It would be helpful to have Barry, give Barry an idea how many of us are coming. Right now, I plan to attend in person. It's, uh, Rick and Dom will be on remote. And for Montpelier City Council right now, only the mayor plans to be in person. Everyone else expressed last night at city council meeting, they would be attending remotely. So is there, if people could raise their hand if you think you wanna be in person. I'm just trying to line up chairs. So we're all sort of sitting together if indeed you're coming. Do people plan to attend remotely? Okay, good, good. Great. And Donna, then, do, uh, are we going to get a, uh, a Zoom link for that meeting? Yeah, as soon as Barry City Council gives it to me, it's their Zoom link. I've asked for it by Friday. When okay. I get it, you'll get it. I have to put it in my agenda yeah. for us. Okay, and October 20th is a 7 p.m. time for Capital Far Mutual Aid, and they've invited select board members to join them remotely. Now, Montpelier, uh, because I reserved the space, we have the city council chambers, which I'd already uh, reserved as we were gonna do the joint meeting. So Capital Far is using that space. Actually, um, 
they prefer that regional plan the public safety authority host it. So we'll host it live at the city chambers and we'll do the remote link. And that will come out shortly. Any people here think they'll attend on the 20th for that presentation in person? Okay, now that's the one I have lined up, Cameron, to be here. So we will have the big screen. And there may be some city council members who may attend that just uh, remotely just to hear some of the discussions. Is that, is that a joint council meeting or is- the No, the 19th is the one that's booked at the joint council meeting. The 20th is Capital Farm Mutual Aid. Oh. And their select board members that they've invited. Well, I, I will attend. I, can't, I don't know that I'll be remote or in person. Okay. Anyone else? I hope you'd all uh, attend uh, remotely if you can't come in person and have some ex opportunity to exchange uh, comments and hear from Capital Fire Mutual Aid Chiefs. Uh, any other any questions about the 19th and 20th that haven't been covered? Uh, Jim. Yeah, the Capital Five Mutual Aid meeting is the 20th, and where is it? It's going to be held at uh, Montpelier City Hall, at Montpelier Chamber Room, okay. and it will be held remotely, hosted by us, Public Safety Authority. Uh, I'll attend that one. I am unable to be available Tuesday night, the night before, for the City Council of Barry. Okay. Anna, can so, I ask a question? Yes. But what way do you believe will create the most interaction in either meeting? Uh, the Capital Far, because we're not limited to time, uh, the, the Barry mayor really wanted to move the joint meeting from the 20th to the 19th and incorporate it into his city council meeting. So we only have exactly an hour, six to seven. I mean, so it's gonna be a very focused meeting. And hence I've invited both councils if they want to, because they might have more questions than are allowed in that hour to join us on the 20th. But the focus of the 20th is capital fire. The focus on the 19th, the city council, although Capital Fire has also been invited. And because both Capital Fire and Public Safety Authority is likely that could have a quorum, it's considered in a meeting. So we have to do our own agendas, our own set of minutes for both nights. And we would love people to be in person if you wanna come join us. Uh, on the 20th, particularly, it will be, you know, we'll have the big screen and Barry on the 19th will have theirs. But remotely is totally acceptable. Okay. Just that those of us who are live have to speak through the mask. So you're not as easily heard as you are when you're all remote. It's a constant problem on, at city council meetings. And likewise will be to ours. Any other questions on those two presentations? Now we have an invoice from that I sent you or Brent sent you attached from Televake for those presentations. Um, it's 2,383, it's all broken down. It's estimate, if it's less time, they'll charge us less. And indeed, you know, um, they did so much extra without any overcharge. Paying this will, will come out still under the 55 allotted money for a phase one study. So I would really appreciate being able to advance this. Otherwise, this presentations are gonna fall on us and probably have to look to Doug Brett and Joe and Doug and Paco and many others to help carry the same weight that Rick and Dom will have on their own. So I would entertain a motion that we approve Televate's expense up to the $2,383 that is their estimate cost for the two presentations. 
So moved. Second. I'll, second I'll second it. Uh, Doug, I think Doug Hoyt second first. It's okay, whatever works. Okay. And all right. Any further discussion about this? All in favor, starting to vote. Jim? Aye. Doug? Aye. Brent? Aye. Kim? Aye. Sally? Aye. Donna? Aye. Now, I apologize. We have two people, one I don't know, but others seem to. Uh, and Carrie, I believe, Carrie McCool, are you not a dispatcher coordinator in Montpelier? Yep, I'm the dispatch supervisor in Montpelier. Supervisor, thank you for the right title. Sorry about that. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. And hopefully you'll be able to join us for the presentations, whether that's Thursday or Wednesday re remotely or in person. Yeah, it, it'll depend on what our staffing issues look like. Right, right. I think on the 20th would be really good since you dispatch for Capital Fire. You know, that would yeah. be wonderful if you could make that. And I'm sorry, I didn't even think about putting you on uh, the distribution for that material, but I'll send it out to you tonight when I get home. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, Caroline, you're there and Deputy- I am, Chief. Madam Chair. Nice to see you or hear you or- Hear you or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and although, nice to be here. Although Stephen did get to see the screen, I'll just continue. We have the Deputy uh, Chief and Barry, Joe Allsworth. And we have the chief, Doug Brent. We have Orca also on the screen. Uh, did I miss anybody that's, okay, cool. Done. We voted on that, that's all done. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, Paco, how about your report on your working group? Hello everybody. Uh, Paco Almond, for those that uh, would like me to introduce myself. Um, I. I have to, I'll, I'll apologize ahead of time. I don't know what goes on with my computer, but every now and then it's pretty, seems to be unstable. And I don't know if it's my internet connection or the computer, but it it uh, causes me to drop off. So I, I'm hoping I can get through this presentation. It's probably time to buy a new computer, but be that as it may. Um, the, the bulk of my update is, or all of my update is centers around a meeting that I convened on uh, October 6th with representatives of Capital Fire. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Casualty. Yeah. I think the cutout is your Wi Fi, <laughs> it's not your computer. Um, no, is it? Is it bad? Yeah. yeah, you just totally, totally stop. Frozen, no words. How about now? Yep. Yep. All right, let's try again. A meeting, October 6th, made up of representatives of Capital Fire, uh, Berry City Fire Department, Montpelier Police Department, and uh, Doug Hoyt representing CBPSA was there. Specifically, Doug Brent, Ryan Pete, Eric Nordstrom, Carrie McCool, uh, Paul Cerruti, Sally Dillon, uh, Will Sutton and uh, Joe Aldsworth was invited but couldn't attend. At that meeting, we we the intent was to try and uh, see if we couldn't develop a consensus around how to move forward with a working group. Who should be part of it? What should we be doing? Um, and uh, to see if we could come up with, say, a, a, a common vision and. Uh, basically how to move forward. And the bottom line from the group was that uh, we really can't move forward until after the meetings of the 19th and 20th. It is vitally important that the city councils and that the uh, invited select board members from the Capital Fire communities hear about the project and basically give give the collective group, give the public safety officials, give CBPSA a direction to move forward and authorize at least the establishment of um, 
a committee. And that establishment is really authorizing their staff to work in a planning process concerning how to move this project forward. Uh, and in, in terms of who should be the, what the makeup of that committee, it might be part of this core working group that we just, uh, we just had on October 6th. It might be the current Twin Cities working group that exists. But the goal is to get good representation of key stakeholders that have the time, expertise, and desire to participate in helping to advance this uh, radio communications project forward. Some of the, uh, I, I'll just go through some of the outcome statements that uh, I heard, uh, or I should say statements that I heard people make was uh, basically keeping all communications on the air, on the air is what the vision should be about. Recognition that the radio system is failing is it's both a reality and a safety issue for first responders. Uh, moving on, funding this project should be the focus the fiscal agents need to weigh in on before any further decisions about working groups can be made. Uh, it is, oh, not everybody agreed that this should be a one project with costs shared by all, but I would have to say that it was the consensus of the group that this should be a single project. It's pointless to move forward without the governing bodies providing guidance as to how to move forward, especially around finances. Um, no one has said the project is not needed, but an understanding of cost is very important. A summary of cost and payment models is important to produce so that everybody can see what the dollars are going to cost them, what it's going to cost them. Uh, the Televate report needs to be shared with all Capital Fire member communities. Select board representatives from Capital Fire communities need to attend the upcoming uh, Capital Fire CVPSA meeting. Uh, again, working together on a single communications project, not separately, is important. CVPSA future budget requests should be asked of all CVPS members. That includes Capital Fire and Capital Fire Mutual Aid System and its communities need to contribute to CVPSA. Uh, we did, we did uh, they suggested next steps, uh, which basically should be that the uh, Capital Fire representatives who were there, Paul, Will, and Sally should make out, should work through the Capital Fire Mutual Aid District system to get select board members at the October uh, 20th meeting. We need to, somebody, this group for the future needs to finalize the cost of the project and then develop cost models as to who pays what and how it's paid for. Work together with all select boards of CMSC, uh, Capital Fire, communities and expose them to what this uh, project is. Outreach and liaison work is very important. Um, work together on a single radio communications, not work separately, and obtain a realistic bond interest rate and develop a cost model. I can tell I will tell you and share with you that I've reached out to the Vermont Bond Bank and uh, I was told that a general obligation bond has an interest rate about 1.6% right now. Um, I've done a considerable amount of research on uh, uh, the cost models of bonding. And uh, unfortunately, I got way more of an education on, um, no, I shouldn't say unfortunately, I did get way more of a financial education than I thought I was going to get just by uh, doing some research on, on the web. The bottom line for me is, uh, and I reached back out to the Vermont Bond Bank, and I gave them different funding scenarios, and they were going to develop for me a 10-year uh, uh, cost modeling uh, proposal. Uh, I don't know if proposal is the right word, but some idea of the cost of uh, uh, different, different cost models. I told them that uh, I, and I gave them the rough cost for the entire project that's been identified. That's uh, $3.9 million. I extracted out the Twin Cities proposal and um, 
uh, gave two scenarios for that, one that Barry and Montpelier would pay for and one uh, isolating the simulcast system or the remaining cost for the simulcast system for Capital Fire. And then I asked for a, uh, a bond cost model for a combined twin city and building project along with the uh, radio consoles just to see what that would look like from a cost. I have not heard back from them yet. Uh, <clears throat> Anybody have questions for Paco? Yeah, that, that's 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 pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, but the other aspect that the bonding talked about is that a public safety authority lacks substantial experience and administrative capacity to actually take on bonding. And uh, you want to explain a little bit about that, Paco? Yes, when I uh, when I introduced myself and talked about the uh, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority and, and gave an overview of the uh, the uh, uh, project and what we had hoped to do. Uh, the first thing uh, Michael asked me was, uh, at a minimum, we need two years of uh, certified financial audits. And then he went on the web page and saw that uh, really Central Vermont Public Safety Authority is a fledgling organization, and at best has only had a maximum of a hundred thousand uh, dollar budget. And then he asked if we had any assets, uh, which I said, <laughs> CBPSA has no assets. And so he said, well, uh, while bonding an organization such as CBPSA is not impossible, uh, there are an awful lot of hurdles that we would overcome. And he candidly said, the easiest way to get this project funded is through the two cities. So uh, that's, that's the information that I have from the Vermont Bond Bank on bonding. Uh, and as we move, as the organizations move forward, um, that's got to be a consideration. Again, how's it, how, how are we going to pay for it? What is the cost model we're paying for it? Which leads me to uh, one other aspect of, of the working group, if you will. Um, my recommendation to everybody is that this should be less labeled a CVPSA project as it is as a, co a, 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 a coalition. collective yeah. coalition. Yes, it's a it, it's it's a coalition. I think that's a that's probably the best word. CVPSA can take maybe the lead in in, in, in helping to steer it, take the lead at least in planning. Uh, but I don't know that, that, that the coalition has really decided on how it's going to be managed and who's going to pay for what and who's going to be the fiscal agent. So I think we ought to keep that in mind as I think you ought to keep that in mind as you move forward and uh, uh, make sure that the coalition has the best interests of all public safety agencies in central Vermont uh, at its forefront. Not that nobody has to this date, but we CV we we CVPSA gets pigeonholed as a as an entity that that uh, uh, may not be capable or in a position to take on such a project as this, and it's not about CVPSA. I like the word coalition. Yes, and uh, if I can just jump from there, and if there's questions specifically to Paco, people can go back, but. Because that leads to, I mean, my emphasis is we're talking about a regional network, coalition, whatever entity, various governance, cost allocation, administration <laughs> falls under, doesn't have to be Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. But we need to be participant in it. And we have the planning money to at least kick it off with this small core team looking at some initial governance models and some cost formulas. And Televate gave me uh, just a, like uh, what you call off the napkin estimate, $30,000, $35,000 to work on that part one of the next phase, governance and cost allocation. But that indeed, we will probably need to go to the towns on town meeting day with 
request for funding to complete phase two, because it's not only formulation of whatever entity this coalition ends up being with its own governing model cost formula, but also they would be doing the RS, RFP for the equipment so that, that could start moving at the same time we reach out for funding sources. And so I see for this year, March 22, 2022, that we consider at our next meeting that I will be sending you materials between now and then, but we consider what we might need to put on the ballot in order to continue this planning model so the coalition can have a very substantial entity that the towns and cities can totally commit to and move forward with the 3.9 million equipment acquisition. And so if nothing else, public safety authority can keep moving on the planning portion to support this entity, whatever it ends up being, so that we would be able to use the expertise we started out with here with Telegeek. We said we were gonna do phase two, we just have to put the money in place in order to afford to do it. And that with Paco's help, especially reaching out to invest in the select board. We really need someone facilitating their involvement, going to them, really talking directly with them and bringing them on board along with all the capital far chiefs in those communities. So what I'm proposing to have you all think about and hopefully kick off a discussion tonight is one, considering a future contract with Tel Aviv for phase two, part one, that's just dealing with governance and some formula, cost formula, funding models. And then what would go in the town meeting for us to have by FY23 would be money that then they would work on the RFP, not only create it, distribute it, evaluate it, working with us, make that happen in a way that's really viable with other funding sources. So then we can do what Leahy wants us to do, what we know we need to do, we need federal dollar, state dollar, local dollar, that none can do it on its own. And so that by FY24, we actually then can go out and ask for the 3.9 million or whatever it is at that point. Did I lose anybody? This coming March would be about more planning money. And then the next March would be about capital acquisition. And so we would lay that out to be discussed at their November meeting. So then we have our annual meeting in December. Our first, our meeting in December right now is uh, December 9th. And if we start advertising close to uh, right after our November meeting, we'll make our 30 days notice to get our annual report out, our three-year budget out, get our warnings done, get ourselves in line with all the deadlines for the cities because we do our voting through them. So we have to court not only our charter deadlines, but also the city deadlines. So this really has to start in motion in November to meet all those. Have I lost anybody? Sort of getting the flow? Paco. Donna, I, I, I wanna, uh, again, uh, reiterate that uh, having Televate still involved, uh, I think is important. Um, we cannot do any cost modeling at this point until we, we ask Televate uh, the question of, is, is the cost proposals that they presented realistic? Um, can they be altered downward at all? Can they take another look at, at the, uh, the, the cost numbers and see if in fact they're, they're accurate? as we move forward, perhaps to, uh, towards an RFP. And the other uh, part, part that we have to in, keep Televate engaged for is there needs to be a refinement uh, and or a validation of, of the uh, scope of work requirements that will go into an RFP. So, uh, uh, so you know, I, I keep hearing people talk about an engineering study. Well, it, maybe so, but, um, in my mind, that all that all starts with uh, understanding again the needs uh, of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, and that those needs are cap 
captured properly in a scope of work to go in an RFP. And I really think that Televate is the entity that, that will have the best ability and expertise to do that. So they're important to stay around. Well, and the only correction or addition I would say to that, Paco, is not public safety <clears throat> authority a need. It's a coalition's need this, that Televate really needs to nail. It's a coalition. Uh, Doug Brent, can we speak? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. First, first try. A um, couple things. As I think about and I hear anything as far as this planning goes that ends in the last two numbers of 24. Somebody needs to ask Televate or somebody else, is what we got gonna last till then? Number one. Number two, because I don't think it is. Number two, uh, Paco just spoke of it. Is there any way to talk to Televate about adjusting their numbers down? If it ends in 24, the numbers are not going to go down between now and 2024. They're gonna go up. Um, and thirdly, in talking to a vendor the other day, I said, if I had a box of money sitting in my office right now and said, let's build this, when can you have me on the air? Next November, not 30 days from now, next November. So whatever our planning date ends and whenever we go out and think about awarding a contract, we got another whole year to think about being on the air after that. And will what we got now last that long? And what do we do if it doesn't? I, I totally agree. And so does uh, Rick and Dom. It's like within our structure of funding and our town meeting act requirements, how, how can we make it sooner, Doug? I don't know how to make it sooner. I mean, can we possibly be ready for this March to make a big capital act request? I don't know. I think as Paco has spoken and you have as well, Donna, I think that next Tuesday and Wednesday are very important nights for this because this group of people that's here, not just the CVPSA members, but everybody that's vested in this are going to walk away from that knowing if there is any appetite for this project whatsoever. Uh, at that point, I know that I will be able to answer to my city council and say, you know what, we need to move on on our own or we need to wait out this this process because they're right. going to ask for me, me to weigh in on that. Um, because Absol the, absolutely the, and safe, the safety of our employees, the safety of my employees as I send them out the door is going to depend on this. So I have two questions. One is, let's just say, because the ask I'm asking the councils on Tuesday night is, for them to direct their Twin City teams to invite Capital Farm Mutual Aid and Public Safety Authority, along with our consultants, to develop some regional governance models and funding formulas. And can they do that in November, December? I mean, how fast can they do that? Are people on board to do it quick? And if they, within those models, there's one of the cities says, we'll take on the bonding, go forth and put it on the ballot. And then right there and then you use the cost formula they said to put it on the ballots, which has to include capital fires towns. So you see, it gets complicated. I, I don't know how to do it quicker than the March 23. I mean, I, I'm totally with you. <laughs> Find a way, I'll follow. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, Marco? Paco, um, I don't think he's there. Well, he, he's muted, but well, my, my question is, I don't see him. I'm here. Oh, yeah, he's there. Is. is an RFP premature? What if we asked our vendors, no, this is no. what we want to build. Could we do an RFP and get a number? Uh, no, in fact, uh, they're really hesitant of even trying to do an RFP before you have the funding because the oh, RFP yeah. goes to the vendor to match that, not telling you what equipment you want well, before then, you figure out what your standards are. The okay. RFP then says, this is our standard of performance. You match it with the equipment and you're held accountable until that equipment gets us to that standard. Yeah, that makes sense to me. But 
I don't see how we can ask the cities to bond to do things for the towns unless the towns are in. Well, that's Somehow. why we have the core team working with, and that's yeah. what. The, now that's yeah. that's a hard nut to crack. Uh, but it just, I mean, Doug Brent is right. I mean, it's not fast enough. And likewise, are there examples you're willing to share with the joint councils on Tuesday of saying these are the real life threats that can go wrong? These are the ones that have already gone wrong that we managed to get through without losing a life. I mean, are you willing to be uh, bold enough to show that vulnerability in real clear functional terms to the councils? Because I don't think they get it otherwise. Uh, one thing that Fred Collins did really well before he left, he got Montpelier City Council to really hear what would happen if the councils went down. Even though we felt that it wasn't that old, he really made a plea about how it functioned what would happen when it didn't function right? How hard it is to get parts out of things that are no longer being made. Uh, I mean, he made a good case. They heard it. Um, and that's what I'd, I'd like us to do on Tuesday is somehow bring the person, the actual situations for the worker and the residents who are in crisis and what failed telecommunication means to that. Sally, you have suggestions? Joe, Doug, I mean, really. Uh, I think we need some really core examples like that. Jim. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just kind of follow through on Chief Brent's uh, hypothetical um, because it, it might really be the item that gets the city council's attention. If there was a catastrophic failure, and now as they're set up right now, they have really two different systems. Um, if there was a catastrophic failure in the Montpelier Capital West system, Capital West customers would expect them to rectify it. So the whole ball of wax might be on Montpelier. And the same would be the case with Barry City if it went down. You have customers, you have contracts that you have to meet. And when you're in that position, you don't have a lot of choice. You just go out and buy it. And that's not something that I think that either city council would, would, uh, would welcome or relish. Uh, so that might just give them some pause to say we need to have a a better plan in place uh, that that gets executed before the, any sort of catastrophic failure. So I just started thinking of that as he was talking. What happens if it does fail? Whose back is it on? Whose back is the monkey on? It's on each city council and each city alone. Anyone uh, willing to work on that approach for Tuesday night? Definitely, uh, Rick is working on, the focus of his information is using the information within the report, but supplementing from the angle of what is at risk. That's the question I've asked him to answer for the city councils. What's at risk? And if we can supplement that with your own experiences, frontline people of where you feel vulnerable, where things haven't worked, where for the love of God, we didn't have a crisis worse than what happened. That would really be, I think, just so meaningful. Hey, Donna. Yes, Joe. I, I'm, I'm not volunteering. Okay. But there's a third leg to Jim's stool is that the infrastructure that is on the towers is owned by Capital Fire. And that mm -hmm. also leans on to them and they are not prepared to, to tackle a uh, catastrophic failure. And Sally, I look to you. I mean, that, that's the truth and we've talked about it and they're currently not prepared to address that. Yeah, there isn't a plan right now if that were to happen. Okay. Uh, Stephen's asked to speak. Uh, Steve Whitaker here. I I would ask, suggest that you ask Televate, even if it's an add-on function, to identify the weak links and, and where spares might be it, it looks like it's going to take a year or two before a new system can be constructed. 
if not longer, uh, both planned, financed, and, and constructed and tested. So I think what I don't find in the Televate report is the inventory. That was the purpose of asking the photos and the inventory I understood Dominic was going to provide to Paco. Instead, all he provided was, was, tele, was photos. But the inventory of what are the weekly pieces of equipment that could fail and are spares available and how quickly could they be installed, I believe is a necessary prudent precaution to be taken now. I, I don't doubt that there are vulnerabilities in the system that could take it offline or both systems, Barry and Capital Fund. Capital fires, but identifying what, what where those weak links are and taking necessary planning steps to inform and reassure these city councils that this is a prudent investment in this planning and we can find a way to bridge this system uh, reliability until that time as a new system can be brought online. So that's that's my suggestion. Any clear statements people want to make or offer to make on Tuesday evening or send me some narrative that I can offer? And definitely, uh, as both uh, I or Televeet talk, we would love the support in the audience, be it in person or remote, when you want to chime in to support or emphasize or supplement an aspect. Um, the end result is getting the city councils committed, absolutely committed to act and be involved and to own this coalition and help us get to the goal. Doug, is that a wave? Doug, point. you're muted. Not anymore. Nope. Um, I'd like to, Take a shot at uh, trying to put Joe Oddsworth a little bit on a on a spot here, uh, Joe. In terms of when we get to uh, Tuesday, um, do all that discussion. You're probably as as familiar with the entire system as anybody is. Um, so if you had to place a $100 bet tomorrow, what piece of equipment would you bet is going to be the first to fail? Mm. I know that's a shot in the dark, but if you had to bet, that's a stumper, I know. I know. I, I, or what I, do you I, worry the most about? To be honest with you, it's the system itself. I think that it's important to realize that some of the components are in excess of 35 years old. Yeah. That some of the towers uh, need need to fi be finished, upgrade to uh, E lines, you know, the fiber. But also the core of the uh, the dispatch system is the consoles. And right now it's been identified and Fred did a good job about it is that the consoles are obsolete. There's no, there's no parts to be had other than to hit the open market and try to find something. So I can't really tell you on that $100 uh, challenge, Doug, is which one will go first. But the core of the dispatching system is the consoles. And Chief Brent and I have had this conversation. They are essential to, to working. And if something happens in Barrie and it goes down with the consoles, we have the bridge to, for Montpelier to absorb that. But that's an issue because that's a huge burden on Montpelier to all of a sudden absorb that. Vice versa, if Montpelier were to go down, for Barry to step up and take that all on in one shot, that's huge. Now, if you look at the towers individually, each tower serves a community. 
And if that tower goes down, the other towers can pick up the slack, but there are going to be holes. There are going to be issues with coverage. And that's where the lives are affected. What Chief Brett was saying is that those, those emergency responders kind of go in the dark because they're not interlinked. Does that, okay, so, I, know, I know that doesn't answer your question, Chief. No, it does. It does answer the question because I think the focus has to be on the, on the consoles, if I'm hearing everything. Um, and but the cities guess, have already committed themselves to the consoles. Yeah, but it's not done. Well, They're committed, but. The money's in the budget. Well, it, FY22, it was in the budget and pulled out because of um, it doesn't reduced out. revenue. So it's still there as a priority to backfill with uh, rescue money. Yeah, I'm from, I'm from a state that wants to see it. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll, I'll, you know, I've, I've been around this, this block before, you know, we'll get to it, we'll get to it next year and next year comes and goes and we're still getting to it. Um, I, th I think it's the, the answer that Joe was getting to was, was the consoles, but it's also, it's also in effect the system. Mm -hmm. And, and if, uh, if one of, one of the consoles go down or a part of that console goes down, you know, things get pretty tough, but if, a if a tower goes down, there's a way to work around it, perhaps, maybe, all depends which one goes down. Now, if it's if a tower goes down that's only serving a small population versus a tower that goes down that's serving a large population, that's a much different problem. So you just can't, you just can't pick out a particular tower that needs to go. I think the report's going to point out that. The reason I asked the question to Joe, and I apologize, Joe, for putting you on a hot spot, but if we're talking about what it is that we're going to talk about um, on Tuesday and or even Wednesday, for that matter, um, what's going to fail? What's our priority? When I say our priority, I mean the Central Public Safety Authority, but Central Vermont, all of it, you know, Montpelier, Barry, and all of the other organizations that are providing these critical links of communication. What's our priority and what needs to be identified and addressed funded? What are we going to do? Could I ask a question of about that? Okay, is Doug's done? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Okay, the, yes, Kim. Have, do, are the councils that we're talking about buying the state of the art, will they handle future needs of the organization or are they just to keep the status quo? I'm thinking of LTE and, and other forms of communication that might come in the future. Is your question related to the councils they're considering? Yes. The specs for specs no. for those councils have they been specked out? Do we know what's being asked for? Well, I know that Fred had quite a few ideas about it, but no, the RFPs have not gone out. They have not been. My understanding, Joe, correct me. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna look to Carrie for for some input, but from what I understand, the consoles that were specked out were expandable and were able to to address future needs, but they were mainly focused on uh, the current system. That's my understanding as well. And who, who did the specs? Is that Televate? Did they help you with that or where do those no, come from? No. no. Oh, sorry, I'm interrupting people here. Um, those were something that the, the previous dispatch supervisor, Fred Cummings, had gotten numbers for the specs on. Yeah, he went to the vendor and, and, yep. and got specs. Well, I think we ought to ask Televate to weigh in on before we buy something to make sure they'd fit 
future needs. Uh, that's absolutely the next step after we deal with this first big couple of giant steps, yes, or the specifics of the equipment. But uh, anything else directly dealing with failure, weak links? What's the risk? Yes. I'm going to very brief. Okay. Uh, Steve wants to make another, Steve, another comment. Okay. I'm going to make a very specific suggestion here, and I think y'all just ask you to take it under advisement and take notes and verify it elsewhere. The issue of connectivity, the fiber, what Joe refers to as E-line, it doesn't have to be E-line from consolidated. There are various competitive options for that, but it basically means fiber connectivity to the tower sites. That's something that we're going to need no matter what, no matter how long it takes. And I see the weakest links from what I'm hearing, the weakest links in the system are generator backup power. That can be addressed now. It's easy to size a generator for a system that will install a few years from now. Connectivity, which is the fiber. The consoles, which we are discussing about, not yet ready to settle. And then even microwave backup connections. Microwave can provide a connection to the transmit tower, even if a hurricane comes through and blows down the aerial fiber. So those are four things that we could do some pre-engineering on that we know will still serve the new system. So I would ask you to consider uh, asking Televate, assigning Televate that task. It's, it's not a whole systems engineering, but those are four things that we know are gonna be useful to us with the current system and harden, serve to harden the current system, as well as serve uh, in the new system. Thanks. You know, and the councils may very definitely um, certainly give us our homework and come back to them, and we'll do that. Uh, Doug Brent, go ahead. So, so um, to answer Stephen's um, idea that he just had, I don't believe that. A majority of the things that he just spoke about are even in the price outs that Televate has given us to date. Most of the communities that we're hoping to um, get behind this project are not even going to be close to being able to afford the numbers we've already got, say nothing about added generators and things like that for each site. I'm not disagreeing with him that this stuff doesn't need to be had. I'm what I'm saying is that I don't believe any of the preliminary numbers that they've thrown us um, can talk about redundant uh, microwave to every site and or generators for every site. It's wonderful to harden every one of the sites. We've all heard about it. We all agree with it, but I don't believe that pricing is even in the preliminary figures that they have thrown out. Paco may know the answer to that, and I might be completely wrong, but I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, Joe. Uh, just so you know that currently all, all current sites are being upgraded to E-lines. That's already been in the process for the last uh, year and a half, and it, it will continue to go through. That's already in the process. Um, most of the sites have generator backup. The one site that was identified, we've been working with Velco to connect, that's the Woodbury Tower. And they're in the process of doing that. And Burlington Communications has been helping us with the load on that. So that's that's an in process. So just, just to make sure everybody knows that. Okay. Microwave links were not included in the Televate proposal. Okay, I, I think as far as trying to focus on this within the city councils, there's only so much, I'm gonna call it details on equipment they're gonna absorb. But the, the base essence of the equipment listed within the 3.9, I felt here and within the small working group that Paco just went through, support moving forward with that 3.9. And that's the SIMA class that Capital Car really wants. And that's that Twins City, I got the right words here. Um, 
I'll go help me. Um, in building yeah. coverage. In building in coverage. Building coverage. There you go. Uh, yes, in building coverage. So those are really solid, and that's behind the three point nine. And the three point nine is the beginning of a lot of needs, but it's a real essential beginning. And that assumes the city moving on their consoles. And we can keep harping at that. We're assuming the cities are gonna follow through on their commitment of the consoles. Yes, Doug, Brent. Um, remember those words that you just said, Donna, because what we, the Twin City Group recommended to the CVPSA was that the cities step up and replace their consoles. The cities, the city councils have not agreed to do that. I'm not aware of in Montpelier or in, I can speak for, definitely for Barry. The city council has not agreed to do that here yet. That would be our recommendation to them and Steve's recommendation to them as well, but they have not agreed to do that. So I'd be very careful at our meeting um, with both councils that that doesn't get said, well, we really appreciate the city stepping up to do the consoles. Our city hasn't stepped up to do it yet. Our recommendation is that they step up to do that, but they have not agreed to do that, nor have they come up with the money to do that. Uh, well, Mom, tell you one step further. I said put it in an F FY22 budget and then removed it when we were short, but it's there to be replaced. I mean, to be, yes, to find the money to do. But so I'll work on the way to word that, that we're, we're looking and we're seeking that support of the cities moving forward on their console. So just, I'll put it in an affirmative desire. How about that? <laughs> okay. Donna, Donna, may I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, I, I think these were basically, uh, well, were good discussions and, and I'm sure Brent will capture them in a minute. But I think all of uh, these discussions mm -hmm. should be uh, referred to the next step which comes after the city yes. council's capital fire uh, debate it next week. But a, a lot of these issues need to be uh, uh, resolved at the working group level um, in terms of coming back with solid recommendations. Right now, it's it seems to me to be almost a shotgun effect. And, yes, uh, yes, no, you're right. And the focus with the councils are to get them to have a broad picture about specific needs <laughs> and that's well the yeah that that in uh, uh empowering the coalition to move forward with planning yep. yes yes okay well we'll uh, keep working on it and everybody show up on tuesday and wednesday next week the other thing that was mentioned here that we didn't get to was we did get a letter and it was in draft form for a while uh from uh, capital Farm mutual aid that was sent out and just really sally you may want to make a comment here just so appreciate it and how much it aligned with the twin city teams letter that when i combined it to sort of restate for the two councils you know there were like four real solid things there that they both mutually stated as a priority focus to move on and that just dovetails with the whole building of the coalition, not about public safety authority, but about creating a coalition and getting the right people at the table. And that's what we want the council to authorize, getting the right people at the table in the working group. Any comments you'd like to make on the letter? Um, no, I, I agree that I think capital fire is behind it. I, our biggest stumbling block is, is going to be the the dollar amount and i'm not sure how we're going to get past that I, yeah. I look at the numbers that paco sent out today and that's just i mean even for a department like ours that has a large budget that is a huge chunk of money and for a department that has a small small budget yeah that is almost their whole budget so um, that's yeah. going to be the biggest stumbling block i think yes and that's why i think in asking for planning money this march we have to have money to get Paco out there as facilitator with the select board so that we as a board can go with him, but we really need a point person to work continuously with the select board to get them really involved. So uh, November is bringing all that to the forefront with some drafts for the annual meeting that would be December 9th. 
along with budgets. And that's the next item on the agenda. Uh, I've already stated the date would be December 9th, uh, November, giving you drafts of elements so we can start working on it. And the other question would be as far as any money for training. At this point, I hadn't considered money for training of dispatchers, but we might want to maintain that. Or, or what do we need, Joe? Do you think the maintenance training expenses will be coming up this next year now that we've gotten everybody certified? Actually, and Barry, we haven't. You didn't. <laughs> yeah, help me there. Nobody, nobody only uh, I think one or two maybe have attended, but I, I'm going to defer that to Carrie. That's her expertise. I think in Montpelier, everyone got certified, didn't they, Carrie? So everybody did get certified who is currently employed. Since then, we have hired, um, we had two vacancies. One has been filled, um, and she will ideally go through that probably at the beginning of the year. Um, and then we will have one more vacancy. And once that's filled, we'd like to get them into it as well. Additionally, we have hired a part-time employee. Um, in keeping with trend, we would like to have them all certified. So you're thinking to budget for the year, what, four people? So we we have three. Um, three. We, have, okay. we have three, yeah. And, and fourth I, would I, give us a backup. Fourth would give us a backup, yes. Okay. Uh, I'll Donna, consider that when I do the budgeting. Uh, Steve, um, I'm sorry, Joe. Joe. Just so you know, they, they have hired two additional new dispatchers. So I'm not sure to speak for Larry, but I know he wanted to... Uh, get them trained up. And if you uh, if you send an email to myself, Larry and Chief Brent, we can uh, talk to him about that. Okay, give me some estimates. Okay, it just would help me to give numbers together, then the board can look at those and we can decide which way to go. Great. Sure. Okay, and anything else on uh, annual meeting that people have questions about or wanna to add to? Okay, uh, Kim asked to talk about the Leahy e -mark, earmark oh, card. Um, you were concerned, you had conversations with Diane that reflected differently than my uh, conversations with Ann, and you sent out a memo, and I did feel the memo was not appropriate, and that we have to be careful not only and he said, she said, but the fact of open meeting law, once we start sharing our opinion, then it becomes a discussion. And if one person makes a statement and nobody responds, we haven't broken the open meeting law, but it doesn't allow anyone else to have an opinion. So uh, express at the same level. So it's better not to do that. If indeed you have something like this, you want to be put on the agenda, then we'll do it and we'll distribute it through the the board mailing and the board meeting in the future, please. So what would you like to say further about this that you haven't already got a chance to say in your memo? I'd just like to add, Donna, that I don't think the open meeting law prevents individual board members from having conversations uh, with each other. And uh, I think sometimes, um, it's helpful to do that so that we don't step on anybody's toes, that we know what what they're thinking and where it's going. And I thought when uh, Diane Derby looked deeper into this, I was left with the impression that we would just reapply and there were some faults with our application. What she said, I think was a clear warning to all of us that um, if we're going to request money, we got to have our act together. And Paco said exactly this, and you said the same thing tonight. And we just need to work harder the next time around and, and really get things figured out. And I think CVPSA, if it's going to be a funding source, has to show that it's a capable body that is supported locally. And 
So that's all in the memo, and I think it doesn't need a lot more discussion. I think it's pretty clear where we're, you've laid out an agenda that we got to follow. Okay, anyone else? Comments on the uh, lady earmark? All right. I wanted to make sure that the committee's got an opportunity to give any feedback into the board as such. Uh, I don't know that anyone, Jim, if you have anything to report or. No report. Okay. Uh, outreach, Doug, you talked well, a little bit about having a meeting with the small working group and you went to a meeting of uh, Capitol Fire since our last meeting, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did do that. Uh, you know, remotely. Um, it was good watching them work through their issues and uh, add to what it is that you see uh, that came to us in a written format. So I think it's all a work in progress. Uh, 19th and the 20th are going to be potential watershed moments for us. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay, hey, uh, Brent, website. Yeah, so <clears throat> not a whole lot for me. I I do want to figure out how we are going to move forward, and I'll work with you, Donna, on trying to figure that out um, as to how we want our website to look, what we exactly want to communicate on our website. Um, if we're looking at this as more of a coalition and we're looking at this as uh, kind of a project, kind of like a landing page, I guess, for, for where... Uh, the towns and where everybody can come to get information. And I think that that's, that's easy to do. It just depends on what our, what we want to market, how we want to market ourselves and our organization. Um, but that's, that's on my radar. Um, everything else. Uh, yeah. It'll, it'll just depend on where things, where things fall, but that's where I'm at at this point. Well, I appreciate you getting things posted, the minutes, the agendas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll keep working on it. Obviously a lot will, the future of the coalition will give us directions. Yes, any other business before us this evening? Okay, uh, then we'll be adjourned at 7.53. Wow, it's eight o'clock mark, good. <laughs> Thank you all, it's been most helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye all. Go on. Recording stopped. So nice.